Shemek, if we can have the previous document back on screen. Um, Lord Fowler, this is the document we were looking at before the break, and I just want to go back to the top of the page that's on the screen, um, because I'm going to ask you about the no conclusive proof formulation that was used in the, in, um, the, the department's statements. Yep. So we can see here what's being said by the author of this document is, as yet there is no conclusive proof that AIDS is transmitted by blood as well as by homosexual contact. But the evidence is suggestive that this is likely to be the case. The evidence relates to some 11 haemophiliacs in the USA and three in Spain in whom the most likely explanation for the development of AIDS was their exposure to American factor VIII concentrates. So that's what's being said in this document. Um, and just to add a further bit of context, um, I just want to remind those listening of what Dr. Wolford's evidence was about her own state of knowledge. So, Shemek, if we can go to um, INQY 100136. Um, and then, Shemek, um, the page I need to go to is, if you're looking at the internal pagination, it's page 121. Um, but I'm afraid I don't have it in, because uh, it's four pages to a page. I don't have it in the form you'll have it. Yeah, try going to about page 30 and see where that gets us to. Page what? I'm um, 30, but uh, we'll just... I don't have a page 30. No, don't worry. It'll come up in a, in a little while. Oh. Perfect. Next page. Almost there. Um, so, um, Lord Fowler, this is part of the evidence that Dr. Wolford gave to the inquiry. Um, and if we pick it up in the... Um, Top left-hand quarter of the page, thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, picking it up at line 12 on the left-hand side, this is an extract from Dr. Wolford's statement. She says, apart from the fact AIDS was occurring in haemophiliacs in the USA who'd received coagulation factor concentrates, I believe it will have been at the end of 1982 or early in 1983 that I read about the presumed case of AIDS in a baby who'd required blood and platelet transfusions at birth and had later developed an AIDS-like illness. One of the platelet donors had subsequently been diagnosed with AIDS. This was the San Francisco baby that has previously been described to the inquiry. It is fair to say that this case, added to the mounting reports of cases in haemophiliacs in the USA, was instrumental in my feeling that it was likely that AIDS was transmissible through blood as well as through sex. And then if we go to the top right-hand quarter, and we pick it up at line 7... Um, this, again, is an extract from Dr. Wolford's statement. From January 1983, the department's awareness of the potential for transmission of AIDS through blood and blood products grew incrementally. And then the question that is put to Dr. Wolford, is it right to understand from your statement that by the beginning or at the beginning of 1983, your sense was that it was likely that this was transmissible through blood and blood products? Dr. Wolford's answer, yes, it was. Um, and then the next question is, was that the prevailing view amongst your colleagues, as far as you can recall? And she says, well, as I say a little bit later on, that I think that view developed incrementally. Certainly that baby poor little thing was a sort of watershed, as far as I was concerned. It rang all sorts of alarm bells. Um, and then um, if we go to the left-hand bottom quarter of the page, please, Shamik. Picking it up at paragraph four, sorry, line 14, the question is, um, leaving aside Dr. Fowler's views, I don't need to trouble you with that, Lord Fowler, um, not, not, not you, a different Fowler, you were aware in the early part, of, were you aware in the early part of 1983 of anyone within the department voicing a markedly different view, doubting or being sceptical about there being a link between blood, blood products and AIDS? And Dr. Wolford's answer, I don't remember really anybody in the department voicing such a view. I think there was a degree of not necessarily scepticism, but reticence amongst UK haemophilia centre directors that this was potentially transmissible. But actually, in the department, I don't recall anybody saying, no, no, it's absolutely obvious that it isn't. Um, so that, that, that's Dr. Wolford's evidence to the inquiry, that certainly from her perspective, beginning of 1983, 
her feeling was that it was likely that AIDS was transmissible through blood and blood products. Um, it, it, so if we can then just go back to the HSSG document, please show me. Top of the second page. And you'll, so you'll see if we go back to this Lord, um, Lord Fowler, um, that the no conclusive proof formulation is qualified by um, the author saying the evidence is suggestive that this is likely to be the case, and then the reference to it being the most likely explanation for the development of AIDS in those American and Spanish cases. So that, that's the context, as it were, for the questions I'm going to ask you now about the no conclusive proof formulation. Um, if, if we look then at what was being said, and I'm not going to take you to each of the statements that were made by the department, but just by way of example, Lord Glen Arthur, July 83, PRSE 0001886. And if we go to the second page, top left-hand corner of the second page, um, so we see the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State, Department of Health and Social Security, Lord Glyn Arthur, my Lord's 14 confirmed cases of AIDS have been reported, etc. Um, and then if we look in the last part of his second paragraph, he says, although there is no conclusive evidence that AIDS is transmitted by blood or blood products, the department is considering the publication of a leaflet indicating the circumstances in which blood donation should be avoided. And, and then... Lord Fowler, as I know you know, because you looked at this material for the purpose of providing your witness statement, a similar formulation, using the phrase no conclusive proof, is used by Lord Glen Arthur in correspondence, used by Lord Clark later in the year, and so on. Um, now, no conclusive proof may be technically accurate, but in circumstances where it was certainly the view of Dr. Wolford, and it seems more broadly accepted within the department in the first half of 1983 that AIDS was likely to be transmitted by blood and blood products. Does it trouble you, looking at it now, that the line to take was expressed in the way it was? Well, <clears throat> I think it was certainly incomplete. Um, what uh, I think is... Uh, troubling is that uh, it was not, we did not uh, continue. I mean, implicitly, it is in the line to take because the line to take goes on, the risk that these products may, be, may transmit disease must be balanced against the obvious risk to haemophiliacs. In other words, <clears throat> you could read that as saying there is a risk that these products may transmit the disease. But, of course, when it comes to the, the uh, headline uh, of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of the answer, that <clears throat> uh, condition, that uh, um, uh, part of it, is uh, 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 left out. So I think there is um, no doubt that it should have had the full version rather more explicitly uh, than it uh, than it did. Perhaps a, a number of things I should make clear, however, that I've no recollection of any concerns being raised at the time about the tension which the inquiry identifies. And I mean, when I listen to what um, even Dr. Walford says now, I mean, I am bound to say, why didn't someone say that? at the time. I mean, why leave it uh, in, uh, uh, in limbo, uh, that uh, particular question? I mean, it is true that, I mean, people didn't need to be a part of the medical division uh, to, to see that there was uh, some uh, absence there. But there was a particular responsibility, I think, upon the medical division to actually set it out. So what happened? Where was the gap there? And we come back to our old friend. Um, I think also that the line did, as I say, implicitly uh, recognise that there was a risk. Um, but I think 
if I'm to be totally fair, I think that the department should have spotted this need to reflect the balance of the background note more precisely uh, uh, in the line that we took. Um, in other words, if we were to use this formulation, no conclusive proof, it would have been better also uh, to include a reference to the fact that the evidence was suggested that it was likely that AIDS could be transmitted uh, by blood. And I'm not going to sort of apportion uh, blame or responsibility uh, to uh, um, whoever was uh, uh, responsible, uh, but, but I think that uh, probably the whole department was responsible. We should have seen the gap there, and unless there's something which I know uh, nothing of, um, then I think we should have uh, uh, spotted it. I mean, there is the other question about what difference it would have made, and I'm not sure that I think it would uh, have uh, ultimately uh, made quite as much difference as um, people appear to be uh, saying it would, because I suspect the end result of it would be that there were, there is a, a, a perceived risk here, uh, there is a perceived risk um, there, and people are just going to have to make up uh, their mind on what the uh, risks are. So, although it is regrettable, um, I don't think it w has been crucial uh, in, the, in the whole story. Um, there's no public statement of which we're currently aware, no public statement alluded to in, in, in your statement either. Um, in the course of 1983, um, um, and I'm just concentrating on 1983 yeah. for current purposes, in which the department, had, I think at any stage, says publicly it's likely that blood products transmit AIDS. We don't yet know how many people will be infected or something qualification along those lines, but there's, there's no public statement um, uh, which which sets out that likelihood. Instead, we have to Parliament, to uh, union officials, to um, those writing on behalf of, of uh, um, constituents, we have the kind of formulation that, 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 that you've referred to. But I think the, uh, the odd thing is that um, I think this was used in a press release, wasn't it? The first, first uh, uh, no, no conclusive proof. And the press release um, uh, was for a leaflet. And the leaflet uh, did, in fact, um, um, say that uh, AIDS uh, could be, uh, 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 that, that it was possible that it could be uh, transferred. Perhaps I'm getting confused, but I yes, think it's we'll, the case. We'll, 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 I'll come on to that tomorrow. The leaflet is a leaflet that goes to blood donors. Yeah, but the two can't be totally... Uh, two, two can't be totally divided. I mean, the public and the people and haemophiliacs are getting their information uh, from several sources. And this is only one source that you're talking about. Uh, the other source um, is a leaflet, um, and a leaflet that has been produced uh, by the government. The curious thing is, or by the health department, the curious thing is that the uh, two do not coincide. That's the, that's the puzzle. And why it doesn't uh, uh, coincide... And um, <laughs> someone appears to have put a black, uh, appears to have actually um, um, changed the end, rather, of the uh, no conclusive proof and missed out uh, the, the, the condition uh, that there is um, um, evidence that it could be. I should just say, Lord Fowler, in relation to the, the donor leaflet, which uses the phrase almost certainly yes, in answer to the same question, that's I think, probably implausible that that would ever have been seen by haemophiliacs who are not going to be, for obvious reasons, there donating blood. Um, no, fair enough. Um, I'll, I'll, we'll perhaps come back to the question of public communication tomorrow when we look at the, the issue of, of, of the leaflet and, indeed, the Council of Europe recommendation um, uh, on, on that issue. But just... In terms of no conclusive proof, as the formulation in, the, in mid through to the autumn of 1983, um, you say in your statement 
um, that you would have hoped that the chief medical officer would have picked up on, on the line to take not getting the balance right, but also that you accept that, that both ministers and senior non-medical officials could yourselves have spotted that tension? Well, everyone should have been able to spot it. I don't understand how it uh, um, 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 managed to get through, um, but uh, it did. Um, and uh, you know, there, there it is. I think you have got to also address the question of what difference it would have made um, had it gone in. Uh, it would, I mean, I'm not sure that it would have made a vast amount of difference because then the department would have had to have explained why. It would have been difficult uh, to explain that there was a, a risk here without any other action uh, uh, being taken, I imagine. Um, yeah, okay. Um, the, the next, um, and, and I think for today, final um, topic I wanted to ask you about is the um, letter from Dr. Galbraith oh, yes. in, in May of 1983. Yeah. If we pick this up just before we look at the letter itself, um, with a minute which summarises a telephone conversation with Dr. Galbraith, it's at DHSC... 0002227 underscore 021. And it's a note from um, um, Mary Sibelis to Dr. Oliver, 6th of May 1983. I don't think there's any suggestion that you would have seen this at the time, Lord Fowler. Um, but it records this Dr. Spence Galbraith telephoned from CDSC this morning with the following information. The male patient in Cardiff, who's a known haemophiliac, now appears to have the right symptoms and signs for a diagnosis of AIDS. And, and a little further information is given about that. The next paragraph, Dr. Galbraith last night received information from Spain that three haemophiliac patients there are thought to have AIDS and have also been treated with American Factor VIII. And then the third paragraph, Dr. Galbraith asks that the department should consider the matter as a priority and asks that any top-level meeting should include CDSC, who are collecting all data on AIDS cases for us. Um, I assured him we would liaise with CDSC and also told him we'd already met Dr. Gunson and he was in touch with regional transfusion directors. Um, so um, th that is Dr. Galbraith from CDSC suggesting that the department needs to consider the issue of AIDS for haemophiliacs as a priority, and the suggestion, that I think it's fair to read, this, suggesting there should be a top-level meeting. What, what uh, I'm conscious that you didn't see this at the time, but what would you expect the department to do, given it, it has that information, that suggestion from Dr. Garbraith at CDSC? Well, I think it's, it, it, it's obviously totally worthy of consideration, and I think that uh, the... Uh, top of the office in the uh, uh, medical division um, uh, should, have should have considered that. If they didn't, I don't know if they did or not. Um, but it's obviously um, an area of concern, particularly in retrospect, um, that uh, um, um, would, have, would have merited a top-level meeting. And then if we look at Dr. Garbraith's subsequent letter to the department at CBLA 5 zeros. 43 underscore 040. Yeah. Um, we can see this is his letter of the 9th of May addressed to Dr. Field. Um, uh, and he, he refers, if we look at the text of it, um, to the, a case of AIDS in a haemophiliac in Cardiff. The case fits the recognised criteria for the diagnosis of AIDS. And then reference to the Spanish case and the report in the Lancet of 11 cases in the USA. Um, and then he says, I've reviewed the literature and come to the conclusion that all blood products made from blood donated in the USA after 1978 should be withdrawn from use until the risk of AIDS transmission by these products has been clarified. Appended is a paper in which I set out my reasons for making this proposal. Perhaps the subject could be discussed at an early meeting with haematologists, virologists and others concerned so that a decision may be made as soon as possible. Uh, and then he says... Um, most surprised that the USA manufacturers of the implicated blood products have not informed their customers of this new hazard. I assume no official warnings have been received in the UK. 
And then if we go over the page, I'm not going to go through his report, we've looked at it in the inquiry a number of times, um, but he sets out there a number of reasons for the withdrawal of, of, of USA blood products. Um, now, I'm, I'm not at the moment asking you what, as a matter of fact, did or didn't happen in, in terms of departmental consideration, because you weren't in, involved in that, um, and indeed there's a, it, it's not entirely clear in all respects what happened. What do you think should have happened on receipt of this communication and this report from Dr. Galbraith? Well, it was one man, uh, Dr. Galbraith, distinguished, but only one man, uh, making this um, fairly radical, very radical uh, proposal. And I think what happened, what should have happened, was exactly what did happen. Um, as uh, Dr. Walford said, um, it was... Um, uh, uh, it would, be, it would have been premature to have uh, cut off uh, the import of um, uh, blood products from the United States um, without um, suggesting any kind of um, uh, alternative, what we were going to do uh, um, as a result of that. And therefore, it led to the conclusion that unless you were careful, you got to a position where there was a greater risk of uh, bleeding uh, than there was uh, of, of continuing um, with the uh, policy. And therefore, what, uh, um, uh, what happened was that there was a uh, collective um, consideration uh, by the Committee for the Safety of Medicines, who basically came to that conclusion. That was in, I think, July 1983. Uh, in other words, in the face of uncertainty, uh, they thought that there was not a case uh, for uh, banning imports at that particular stage. Now, it might be that they, later on they might or might not have done, done but uh, taking a picture at that case, that was their view. But, I mean, the important thing was, however distinguished, Dr. Galbraith was one person. We then had a collective that looked at it of experts. I mean, not just people like you and me, but of experts on blood. Um, and they came uh, to the conclusion uh, that, of Dr. Walford that it was uh, premature and um, uh, the, there wasn't an alternative. And unless you were careful, you were going to do more damage than good. Just, just if we can set aside for a moment the Committee on the Safety of Medicines. Um, well... Would you accept that the, the job of the Committee on the Safety of Medicines is, is to exercise licensing functions? So the issue with which that committee may have been charged would be a question of whether to take action in relation to the license of the pharmaceutical companies in terms of both products or, or, and, and importation. Well, uh, you may well be right that, uh, um, in theory, that that is the case. Uh, but if the... Um, Committee on the Safety, it was a subcommittee actually, it wasn't... It was the sub biological sub... Yeah. Uh, and if the biological subcommittee had come out uh, and said uh, Dr. Walford, uh, sorry, Dr. Galbraith is absolutely correct, that would have had a profound effect, would it not? I mean, people would have uh, uh, jumped up and taken notice. That they didn't do that um, also um, had an effect. So, I mean, one could talk about the theory of it, but... I mean, in practice, that's what it amounted to. Should Dr Galbraith's letter and his report have gone to the chief medical officer? Uh, yes, I, I thought it did. Well, we may, it may or may not have done. I'm, I'm asking you a number of should questions <laughs> rather than did. Well, I'd be, you weren't I'd be slightly surprised if it didn't. Um, and uh, I'd be even more surprised if uh, it having been, I, I imagine, giving a certain amount of publicity, I assume, uh, that the Chief Medical Officer hadn't asked for it. Um, so one way or another it should have gone to the Chief Medical Officer. Should it have been provided to ministers or at least to Lord Glen Arthur as the minister with special responsibility for blood and blood products? Um, I would have uh, thought that was a strong case of doing that, yes. Should Although it... Lord, Lord Glen Arthur at this point uh, would be... Um, Expressing the, uh, if you're right, the collective view of the uh, of the health ministers generally. So it 
it certainly should have been passed to in that group. Should there have been, um, and again, it, um, it's the should question as opposed to whether what happened matched yeah. up to the should, but I'm interested in Lord Fowler. Should there have been a high-level meeting involving haematologists and virologists um, and, and others, as Dr. Galthwaite said, but at least haematologists and virologists? Well, I think probably not on the basis of what had happened up to this point. Um, I mean, if the subcommittee of the Committee of the Safety of Medicines had decided one thing, I'm not quite sure uh, um, what the argument would be uh, in July 1983 in going to have another uh, uh, collective meeting. Should Dr. Galbraith's report, and if we just go back to the document, Shane, we can just look at the, 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 the second and third pages. Um, again, I'm not going to go through the, through the, the detail of it, Lord Fowler, but should what he's setting out here, which is an analysis of, of at least one side of the, 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 the scales, as it were, the risks from AIDS, should this have been shared with, provided to haemophilia clinicians? To who? To haemophilia clinicians. Um, um, it, uh, it, it certainly could have been, and I would have thought probably, probably was, actually. Um, now, you've, you've identified that what Dr. Galbraith was advocating was, I think you used the, the, the term quite a radical step. He was proposing mm. stopping the importation of concentrates. Um, and, and as you say, that was a matter that was in due course looked at by the Committee on the Safety of Medicines to its Biological Subcommittee. Um, just want to explore with you, uh, as the last topic for today, whether leaving aside that rad potential radical course of action, whether this should have triggered other courses of action or consideration of other courses of action by the department. So given what, what he's here saying, you know, concerns about a risk, of AIDS, um, uh, high mortality rates, et cetera, et cetera. Should the department have been asking itself and finding out what alternatives there might be to treatment with factor concentrates? I think it would have been a bit early for that. And I would have thought what the department uh, should have been doing, uh, and I think uh, probably was doing, was waiting uh, for the uh, result of the uh, consideration uh, by the uh, subcommittee of the Committee of, uh, uh, Committee of Safety. Um, that's, it seemed to me, an entirely sensible uh, way of going around it, because otherwise we were going to, uh, we couldn't, well, at least my view would be, that it would be difficult to take decisions of that kind on um, every person who made a proposal or made a a finding, however distinguished Dr. Galbraith might, might be. I mean, I think it was entirely sensible of the department to wait until, we weren't waiting that very long, uh, till July 1983 to see what the subcommittee, which was a group, I haven't got their names here, but I think everyone would agree that they were an expert subcommittee, actually thought of it, of which he was on. Well, he wasn't on it, but he was, giving, he was there. Uh, to, uh, to explain his case. So I think they would have to wait for that uh, uh, before taking any further action. Whether or not the, the, the steps I'm going to explore with you were taken before or after the sub, uh, subcommittee's consideration, should there have been, be between May and, say, end of July of 1983, so after the Biological Subcommittee have looked at the more radical suggestion, should the department have been trying to find out what alternatives there were to factor concentrates? Not at that point, I think, probably. At what point? No, I, well, not at, the, not at the May point or the July. I think it was perfectly, perfectly um, defensible on their part uh, and sensible on their part uh, to wait until there had been a thorough review um, of uh, one man's view. I mean, if we're going to um, start having reviews on the basis of one man's evidence, I, you know, there are going to be an awful lot of reviews taking place. Um, let's say then we, 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 go to, we get to the end of July of 1983. Yeah. The Biological Subcommittee has looked at the matter. Yeah. 
I should say, Lord Fallow, there are a number of question marks over what information it did or didn't have, but I'm not going to trouble you with that because I'm, I'm really interested in the should question yep. than what actually happened um, because the, the chair will make his own conclusions yep. about that. Um, uh, so we get to the end of 19, July of 1983. Um, the Biological Subcommittee has said, well, we're not going to ban it. That's too radical. Would you agree that the, 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 the logical <sighs> step then to take... Um, at least by that stage, is to look and see whether there are any alternatives to the use of factor concentrates or whether there are means of reducing or minimising the use of factor concentrates so as to reduce risk. I mean, you could make, you certainly could make that case, I agree. And would you agree that at least by that point in time, the department should be considering whether there is information that should be provided to the, the cohorts of patients most at risk, haemophiliac patients? I'm not sure. Um, um, I'm not quite sure on what basis you would uh, give that information. You would be saying, although... Um, um, Dr. Galbraith had proposed this. It was looked, looked at by the subcommittee uh, of the safety of medicine who said that there wasn't a case uh, for banning imports. Um, so what exactly, are you, what exactly is your message uh, um, out of that? There are a couple of, uh, a couple of negatives. Uh, there was a negative there which seems to outweigh the original, the original call. Well, Perhaps we can pick that up tomorrow, Lord Fowler, when we look at the Council of Europe recommendations, which included recommendations about providing information to patients and clinicians. Yes. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll return to that perhaps most conveniently then. So uh, uh, note the time, and um, it's probably a good point at which to break for today. Uh, yes. Well, we, we, we promised Lord Fowler at half past four. We've beaten that by a couple of minutes. Um, uh, Lord Fowler, uh, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, if you, if you please. Thank you. Uh, and uh, so it's tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Thank you very much. Mm.